And she, in 2012, Rose rediscovered the first poem she wrote in 1962. And that started her compiling a 50-year anniversary collection. And that's two volumes. And the first volume is checked out. The library has all of her books. And the second part of that set is here for you to check out. And then, what about other Oh, <laughs> I thought I had both up here. And my short and long stem stories is also available at the library right now to check out. The others are all checked out, so a rose. Um, and her, her collections of books also include God, My Greatest Love, Eat, Die, Repeat, and this is my short and long stem stories. And then there's a new collection that just came out of um, a collection of short stories that they chose one of Rose's short stories for that collection as well. She has copies up here if you're interested in that. So let's give Rose a warm welcome. Thank you, Rose. Thank you, Susan. I appreciate it. Thank you very much for inviting me to come. I appreciate that, too. Um, um, well, it's nice to see poets coming out today. I know it's a nice day outside, like she said, and, and so I don't know which is worse, having the snow because we don't want to go out or if we have the sunshine and then we don't want to come to, to something that's inside. Poetry contests. Anybody have any kind of an idea of what poetry judges want? Do you have any, any wild guess of what, what poetry judges want? Anybody entered contests? You've entered contests, okay? Have you wondered what poetry judges want? Yeah. <laughs> well, I'll give you two words. Good poems. Now, saying that, that's very um, short and sounds good, and what is a good poem? And that's probably been argued for centuries, right? So, I've entered contests, and the ones that are in my 50-year collection, some of them have been award-winning. May not have all been money awards, but um, they were competing with other poets at that time. And so I put in there as to what that particular poem did or earned for their, for their contest. But I can't say every poem that I've ever written is a good poem, necessarily. <laughs> I wish I could say that. When I first started writing, it was here in Rapid City. I did spend some time away from here, and I've recently moved back. But one of the um, places that I was, was, or one of the places that I was involved with, was the Black Hills Writers and it's still in, in operation today. And so they had contests, both poetry and other types of writing, creative writing contests, for their members and for anybody else that wanted to enter. And so I did that, and I was encouraged to continue writing because of that. So I think that there's a very good reason for you as a, an author to try for these things. Then I, at the time that I was doing that, it was in the 70s, and I don't know if they're still doing that. Maybe you can tell me or not, because I've, I've been away for a while. The Central States Fair had, a con had contests for writing as well. And then they would display them at the fair with the ribbons that won. And you could get money prizes out of that. And so did the um, South Dakota State Fair in Huron. So I did win some, some ribbons there, and that encouraged me to continue to write. Um, and the first critique sheet that I have on your handout is, is a critique sheet that was attached to a poem that I had entered into the um, state fair. And so I thought I would go through some of those criteria as to what that judge used. 
And it's not as specific as some that I would think that judges would use. But on the other hand, some judges may not use any kind of a critique sheet. And you, as a, as a person that's entering the contest, you won't have any idea at all what they're using for their critiques. They probably will not put out what they're using. And it may just be, they're just going to look at it, they're going to say, this is a good poem, that's not a good poem, and divide them out that way. And then they're going to shuffle those good ones, and they're going to say, okay, which ones are the better ones from those. So you're probably going to have those kinds of judges as well. So you're not going to have a, a specific critique. In most cases, it's going to give you an idea. However, by reading through these critique sheets, it might help you to improve your poems so that they are polished and they are the best that they can be when you send them out. So um, this particular, the one on the first page, judge's critique sheet, um, they're giving 25 points for the three questions. Is an honest attempt to express a thought, belief, or feeling effectively? And they can give, it doesn't say how many points for that particular item or the next two, but that whole section is worth 25 points in some way or another. The second one is, is a patterned unit of experience. Explain to me what that means. I was going to ask you no idea. <laughs> um, I guess they mean it's in some sort of a form that's going to show your experience, but it's going to be in a, in a poetic form of some sort, would be my guess. I don't know what they meant by that to this day. The third one is shows evidence of knowledge of subject. That sounds reasonable. But how do you... How do they know that you have that knowledge or not, even though you wrote that? So the next one is, the next section is concreteness, exactness, and intensity. Does that sound heavy? <laughs> um, the first one's concreteness controlled by good use of imagery, detail, and comparison. So it's going to be both con concrete and imaginative. Is that possible to do? Maybe. Exactness controlled by truthful interpretation, free of over-exaggeration, etc. That's what that judge wanted to, to portray. Achieves intensity through careful selection of details and compactness. So, again, do you see that this is very interpretive? very subjective, and you're not going to get away from judges being subjective. Did you get this before or after you? After. After. So you didn't really have any idea? Okay. I didn't have any idea of what those were. And then I had little marks on there that told me, luckily they did send that to everybody, whether they were a winner or not, so that you could use that as a, a gauge to decide whether or not you wanted to do your poetry differently the next time. Um, but just because you didn't win anything doesn't mean it's not a good poem. Okay? Keep sending it out. Polish it again and keep sending it out. Because what this judge wants may be different than what another judge wants. Plus you might have more competition in one contest and less competition in the next one. And that's going to make a big difference. I send out to a magazine that's called Sow's Ear, and it's a national magazine, to a contest one year. And I got a little note back, which, you know, that's always nice when you get an editor's note that says something, even though they didn't accept it, that's like a, an almost rejection. <laughs> and they said that they liked my poem, but they couldn't use it, and they had, how many entries do you think they had? Any wild guesses? She told me that she had 17,000 entries. 
So there can be stiff competition. Now, I'm not saying all contests are going to have that much competition. And so they have to have some way to sort them out. And I'm not going to go through the rest of this. I think you, I think you kind of follow along that this is not real specific. Um, and now I want you to turn to skip a page. And I want you to go to the one that says 38th Annual STSPS Contest. Now that's your state contest. That's the South Dakota State Poetry Society Contest. Um, unfortunately, it's already passed for this year, but um, they have it annually, and I think their deadline is in November. So the first thing you need to do when you're thinking about doing a contest is look at what are their rules. Because when they have 17,000 or 300 or even 50 entries, they have to have some way to start sorting them out. And if you didn't type it in, let's see, I think one of these, this one may not say that, but let's say it says to do it in 12-point font, either Times New Roman or Arial, a lot of times that's one of the things that they'll say. And if you didn't type it in that, it doesn't matter how good a poem it is. You've got to follow the rules because they'll have to find some way to throw it out so that they can whittle it down to the ones that did follow the rules before. And hopefully they do that before they send it to the judge. Because the judge shouldn't have to look at the ones that that, that contest um, chairman says didn't follow the rules. Okay? So that's the first thing you need to do, is to look at the rules. Read through them very carefully. Um, and if you go down about three two-thirds of the page, it says submission guidelines. And so the first thing I look for in those guidelines is the deadline. Has it passed? Is it too close? Is it too far out? You know, so that you can plan how much time it'll take for you to, to work through your poem to make it polish the best, the best way you can. Um, so this one you could plan ahead if you wanted to for this coming year. And I did put their website at the top of the page, or not their website, I think it's a, a blog at the top of the page, so you can keep track of it and find out when they put out the next rules. So then it says, it must be original, unpublished, and won no more than $10 in a previous contest. Okay, so they don't want one that you've already entered, and I believe that they probably mean in their contest. It doesn't say that, so that's up to you whether you want to interpret that way or not. Um, because if you've only won $10 in a previous contest and in somewhere else in the world, they probably aren't even going to know it. But I think that they just don't want to have the same poems recycled again to them, is my interpretation of that. Okay. And you can send in multiple entries for the first category, and we'll go over that in a minute. But send no more than one poem for each of the other categories. It says two through 103, and I don't think they had that many categories. <laughs> Looks like they had 10 categories, so I'm not sure why they did that. Um, and except where limited, or, or noted, the length is no more than 40 lines. So like the grade school contest that's going on um, at, through the library, if you send in 21 lines and it says no more than 20, what do you think is going to happen? What do you think is going to happen? You'll get this point. And it's really out, right? <laughs> okay. So, um, and usually 40 lines um, is what will fit on nicely on a page, and that's why they usually focus on 40 lines. So that's pretty standard. Um, all poems except haiku and tonka must be titled, because that's true of that particular type of form, is that they do not have titles. Does everybody know what a honk, haiku and a tonka is? I don't know what tonka. You know what Okay. 
a tonka is longer than a haiku, but it still has the same sort of a conventional um, layout. Um, haiku is 17 syllables, and a tonka adds two more lines, and I think they're both seven lines each. Is that? Do you remember that? Okay. All right. I know I have written them, but I, I usually have to look it up. And that's a good thing, too, is to look up any form and make sure, make absolutely sure that your poem follows that form without any, any um, rhythm problems away from that format. If it says, I am, if it says sonnet, it's going to be an iambic pentameter. And so you've got to make sure that it hits that. And that's a rhythm type of thing if you don't know what iambic pentameter is. But make sure there, because what's going to happen if you don't? Disqualified? It's going to be disqualified. You're right. If nothing else, you've learned that today, right? Good. Um, and in most cases, they, a lot of these particular um, contests will want you to send in two copies. They want one with your name on it and one without your name on it. Now that's not necessarily true for the one here because I don't think they indicate to put your name on it or not. And it's probably not likely that the judge would know that, because I'm the judge and I don't know anybody in grade school. So, <laughs> so I don't think it's gonna be a problem if you have your name on it. But follow whatever the rules are that, that they specify. Um, but they want one with your name on it and one without your name on it. And usually what they do is they separate those out. The contest chairman will keep the one with your name on it. They'll send the one without, along with the other poems without, to the judge. Okay? And it talks about the list of winners. And um, this particular one has a, a strange um, format. And I don't think I've ever seen it any place except the South Dakota contest. Um, the zip code poem, and that's category number eight. And down below, it tells you what the zip code poem is. Because you use the zip code for the lines. So you've got five lines, and you follow the number of syllables based on what your zip code is. So if it's 57701, the first line's going to be five syllables. Next one's seven, the next one's seven. Next one, I don't know that you could do zero. <laughs> Maybe just skip that line. I don't know how they would handle that. Oh, yeah, it says it here. You're right. They, they said so. Um, see, you got to read. <laughs> it helps, doesn't it? Um, and then one for the last. So that's, and because it's for the whole state, they'll have all different kinds of zip codes. So that's a, that's a little different. And... Um, I'm going to be honest with you, I don't think that the South Dakota State Poetry Society has a lot of entries. I may be wrong, but I really don't think they do. And so it's a good one to send off because you're not going to have a lot of competition. That's because they charge you to send in things. Well, and a lot of these will. Okay. I don't like that. Well, um, being a, um, one of the members of these types of, of, of societies, let's, let's talk about why they do that. It's to support the poetry, okay? And South Dakota State Poetry Society is a member of the National Federation of State Poetry Societies. There's about 30, 30 of the states that are members of that national society, okay? And in order to sustain that society, or any of those societies, not only the dues that members pay, but when they run these contests, it does two things. One, the, um, the money that comes in is going to be paid out. And you know, the fees that come in are not only going to, to support the, the organization, but they are also going to support the contest themselves. And you'll see that there's a lot of times somebody that is is donating money. The um, second one is Dakota Discovery Museum probably donated some of the prize money, maybe, maybe not all of it. And so this will help to pay out the prize money. OK? 
Okay. So does that give you some idea of why? Yeah, I totally understand it. It just feels to me like... Like you're paying somebody to read your poetry. Yeah. yeah. I don't play the lottery either, so... <laughs> And, and I have a poem that I wrote to that effect, too. I can share it with you later cool. if we have time. <laughs> um, so anyway, it's, it's $5 per poem when you... And, and this was kind of confusing to me when I sent this in the first time. It's $5 per poem in Category 1 for each time... Because they said in for Category 1 you can send more than one poem, right? So each, one, each of the poems that you send in, you send in... Five dollars. So if you if you want to play the lottery more, you get more tickets, right? <laughs> um, it's up to you whether you want to invest that many many more um, in there. But they have a grand prize for that category that goes up to fifty dollars. All the other categories goes up to twenty five. So they're going to get more entries because. Everybody wants to get the 50 instead of the 25. So there's going to be more entries in that first one. So now you got to weigh it whether or not you want to, to gamble more. Okay? Um, any other questions on this particular one? It says down, sponsors manage their own categories. So the sponsors are the people in the parentheses. At the end yes, of each category. Okay. that's true. And I think that the reason that they're allowing them to do that is because they're not the judges. Gotcha. Um, in some contests that are similar to this, usually the one that um, sponsors it is the judge. Or they have somebody that is the judge. And so then they will be eliminated from the competition. Yes, ma'am? Um, are you going to talk about the patient court? Yes. The judging sheet? Yes. Okay. I, I wasn't sure with that. <laughs> well, I just wanted you to get to the idea first of to read through what you're entering first before you um, decide to enter it. And then, and then once, once the um, entries are received, then it's up to the judge, well, the coordinator, to hopefully they would eliminate some of them that are not meeting the criteria, meeting the rules that are already published. Hopefully the coordinator would, would take some of those away so that the judge doesn't have to look at any of those because you don't want the judge to say, well, this is the best poem, and then they say, oh, I got a disqualify. Right. Mm -hmm. You had a question. Am I reading it correctly that you could enter categories, one poem in each of categories 2 through 10 for $15? Which gives you a little bit of a savings, doesn't it? Yeah. Or if you're in a uh, South Dakota State Poetry Society member, it's ten dollars. Okay. And that's two through ten, not including the grand prize one. Okay. And after a while, you get used to some of these because you'll see some of the same things over. Do they often have the same categories? Um, it depends on the. The state and the, the sponsors, and a lot of some of them will repeat the same ones over and over again because they have the same sponsors and they like that particular form or theme or whatever. Um, and other ones you'll see that they're changed. And it depends on whether or not they have a lot of contests, too. Okay, so we can now go to page two, the backup one. This is what I developed, and I'm going to show you this, this side of the page first because this is individual poems. And when I did the um, judging for the four quarters to a section contest, which means that there are, um, it's a chapbook that the so Poetry Society was wanting people to have their poems in a chapbook. Chapbook means cheap. <laughs> and the chat books are usually all about this size, okay? And not always as pretty, okay? Um, and South Dakota State Poetry Society has this contest once a year. And 
they ask people, um, maybe we should have looked at their guidelines. I was going to look at just the individuals, but um, at that, just the fact that it's 22 to 25 pages of poetry, though, that doesn't mean 22 to 25 poems. That means that you could have poems that are longer than one page, but no more than 22 to 25 pages. Okay? And we'll get to the rest of that criteria a little bit. But, um, so then what they do is they, they choose. I was at the National Convention and I saw the coordinator there. And she said, because I was living out of state, she wanted a judge that understood South Dakotans, but was not qualified to enter the contest. So because I was living in Tennessee at the time, and I was a member of the National Federation of State Poetry Societies, and we met, we met in um, Detroit, <laughs> or Dearborn, Dearborn, Michigan. Amazing, isn't it? <laughs> to go to Dearborn, Michigan to connect with somebody in South Dakota. But anyway, she asked me if I would judge the contest because I would know South Dakotans better than somebody that had never lived in South Dakota. And she says, I don't have to, I don't have to say that which of the four was the top collection, because all four of them were going to be published. But we had to narrow it down to those four. Okay? Does that make sense? You look, you look like you have a question. I'm a little confused. Are we, talk, are we on the page two or the chat look at the end? Now? Well, I just wanted, I'm sorry, I did. It's okay. I did. <laughs> um, the, re, the reason I'm just telling you that is because we, this is the criteria for individual poems that I developed when I was judging the okay. chat book contest. Gotcha. Okay? So I'm sorry, I confused you. So back to the individual poems that I judged. I was wanted to give 10 points per poem maximum and one point or none scored for each criteria. Okay. And I thought that it, it was important to have a very good title. You want the title to be something that's going to spark some interest. It's your hook. It's the first thing that your reader's going to see. So I wanted to make sure that whatever poems I was seeing, other than High Clues or Tonkas, that they had a good title. I wanted to make sure that the beginning line would invite the reader in. So that, again, there's another way to hook them into the, into the poem. So that's, that's what was important to, for me to judge. The third one was whether or not they, they used the appropriate person, the first, second, or third person. And they were consistent throughout. And if they used too much you or a one, sometimes that just didn't, it just isn't personal, usually. Um, first person or third person is, is more personal than you. Plus it sounds preachy. <laughs> so that was my personal. Not all judges may feel that way. That was my personal feeling. I wanted the poet to use descriptive nouns and active verbs. Any sentence that's two things that are most important in that sentence is descriptive noun and an active verb. That's going to, going to help. Um, and I wanted it to have sufficient description and imagery. And using things like alliteration or assonance or metaphors or similes when it's appropriate and maybe not mixed or overdone. Okay? So that's subjective for that judge, this, this particular judge. The lines and stanzas should have appropriate line and stanza breaks for each poem. And they make sure that they're all cohesive and that the pre presentation on the page is pleasing. So that when you look at it, it, it looks like a, even if you've made up your own form, it looks pleasing on the page. The word choices, make sure that they are all necessary words, that you haven't added in too many things that are not necessary, like the articles and all that sort of thing. 
And then the next one, even though it's only one point, I think it's very, very important because if it's a form, what did I say earlier? You got to follow the form, whatever it is that it needs to be. And you probably, if you're entering a um, sonnet in, say, the grand prize contest, you're probably 75% of the poems that are in that grand prize contest are probably going to be free verse. They're just out of balance all the time. And if you're competing against free verse, it may or may not be worthwhile to do a sonnet because you're not being judged against other sonnets. And you put a lot of work into making sure that it all follows the form. So you might keep that in mind, too. Depends on whether the judge likes sonnets. They may not like form. And how are you going to know if, if you're probably not? Now, unless they announce in, in advance who the judge is going to be, how are you going to know what that judge wants? You're probably not. If they do announce in advance who that judge is going to be, internet is wonderful. You can go and look and see what that judge has done for their own poetry. And do a little homework and see, do they do sonnets? Do they do all free verse? So take that into consideration. Um, Sometimes you'll find where it's a list poem, the letter D there. Um, just make sure that it's got a little bit more to it than just a list. <laughs> that it's got a bigger, bigger picture. And, and the rhyming. Make sure it's not too disruptive. You know, the too sing-songies, too, too much rhyme. Because that can be just as bad as none. And if you're going to do um, some slant rhymes, be careful with that, too. Slant rhyme is one that almost rhymes. Um, so it may work and it may not. So keep that in mind. Um, the, next to the last one, the poem gives a thought-provoking message. After all, why are you doing that poem in the first place? You want to bring something to somebody's attention. And you don't want them to afterwards go, huh? What was that about? I have no idea where that person was going. So if it's too abstract, that might be a problem. And the ending. We hit a lot on the beginning. What about the ending? Usually a zinger at the end is the best thing. It either sums it all up in one last thing, or it turns you around the opposite direction, or something that really gets attention to that poem when you finished it. Okay? So those are some of my, my criteria.